Hello to all my people, and if you're watching live, checking us out on YouTube, or listening on your favorite podcast provider, you are most definitely my people. Welcome to another episode of Botch Bots and Share Shots. We still have high hopes of delivering quality wrestling content, but if not, we'll sprinkle in some body back and some She Elite Showcase, you know, so we still get over. I'm your host, a chef by trade and a mark by choice. I am the Will Gray, and I'm glad to be on this journey, and tonight, that journey is Anything Goes with Miss Katie Kinsey, baby. Remember, here at Botch Bots and Share Shots, we're calling in the ring from all the angles. Joining us tonight for the first time, she's one of the queens of the IWC. She is a great fan of the, a great friend of the Smacked Raw Podcast Network. She is the lead host of the She Elite Podcast. She is Miss Katie Kinsey. How are you tonight? Thanks for coming on Town Bunch and Wrestling. Wow, thank thank you for the intro. Listen, I love a good intro for myself. Like I try and give myself a good one, but having someone else do it is always a great time. So thank you, Will. I'm very happy to be here. Very excited. I can be honest with you from here. That's it. It's all downhill from here. Once I get through the stuff that I have written down for myself, it's over. So that's all I can hope. <laughs> as long as that part goes well, the rest is up to you guys. Uh, joining us, as always, is the Hova to my Beyonce, the Bonnie to my Clyde, Mr. Yellow Shoe Guy, Bobby Mac. Bobby, how's Texas? Yeehaw. Are you adapting to the Lone Star State? Um, yeah, I'm definitely alone. Um, and this is a star state. Uh the heat is amazing. Um, nothing different than South Florida other than that dry heat that everybody talks about. The dry heat. So what part of Texas are you exactly in? I am exactly stalker. I'm exactly close to Dallas. I so. need you to send me your location on your iPhone next, please, and your social security number. <laughs> All right. I will definitely do that. If you guys want, I'll make that public on Twitter at the end of this at Yellow shoe guy at Twitter. That's a shame. That's, the shameless plugs are for the end, sir. They are for the uh, end. My fault. Okay, Katie, uh, this is your first time on this show. Bobby, you've done 100 of these. Not quite. I think we're at 47, but neither Thank the you. point. Uh, the whole episode is dedicated to one concept and one concept alone. What has you pissed off for greatness in professional wrestling tonight? I mean, it's, it's the biggest topic right now. The, the Sasha Naomi thing right now is uh, it's be, it's like hard to talk about it because there's so much information that is coming out but not from Sasha or Naomi so it's it's a clusterfuck basically and the the discourse online, which is toxic 99% of the time, has just exuded even more toxicity, and it's disgusting. And the fact that it, it, situations like this also, for some reason, bring out the racists everywhere on Twitter as... Wh why? The fact that people are even still racist in 2022 is fucking disgusting. But... I digress. <laughs> this was uh, on mine and Bobby's list both, so I think this is the perfect way to start the show. Uh, Bobby, you want to piggyback off of what she was saying before I go in? Um, yeah, I don't know about much of the racist stuff. All I've really seen is like what the facts are or like what I guess the perceived facts are. That um, <clears throat> Apparently, Naomi was supposed to win the six-pack challenge uh, last night on Monday, and uh, she... Uh, her and Sasha were upset. Um, apparently, the next plan was that Naomi was obviously going to lose uh, her title match, and then Sasha was going to go against um, Ronda Rousey in a match as well, and she was going to lose as well. Um, this is not the first time that Sasha has uh, taken her ball and gone home. Um, so I don't know. A lot of people put Sasha really, really high on their list of everything, I don't know. I'm not a big Sasha fan. I haven't seen it. I think that Bailey's much better. I think that I think she's the last of the horsemen or horsewomen. So I don't know where her ego comes from other than, you know, her cousin Snoop Dogg and she's on Star Wars movies and TV shows. I don't know that Sasha should really be banking this much. And for Naomi to go along with this kind of is weird for me as well because there's rumors that she was actually going to join the bloodline and being the top story for the WWE. So I don't know, like there's there's so much speculation, there's so much rumor going on. I don't know who to side with yet. Uh, I'm gonna chime in real quick. Katie, I completely agree with something you were saying. I feel like it's 
hyper hypocritical of the IWC in a lot of ways because I feel like Tony Storm said the same thing when she left. She was unhappy with creative and, you know, a lot of the same things that we're hearing, not directly from Sasha and Naomi yet, but that we're hearing their complaints were. And I feel like they're catching an enormous amount of heat when people like Tony Storm have left for the exact same reason and caught almost none for it. And in fact, they were praised because they were unhappy with it. So I, th I think that it's, it's unfair. It seems that when one person does it, it's okay. But if the, ex if another person does it, it's not. So it seems very back and forth. Um, so I feel like to a certain extent that it isn't, it's not as clear cut as it seems. We need to figure out their side of the story as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, and from other things I've been seeing is that it's mainly that they just want to put the tag titles in a good position and they aren't able to do that and like so the thing i keep seeing is uh, yes the, naomi was supposed to win on monday go with Bian go against bianca sasha's gonna go against ronda but then you were still gonna just have them be tag champions and not do anything and i have complained about this in the past if you were to have one of them win, I fucking hate double champions, especially if it's people in your tag division list and they've done it constantly with the women. And that's something that irritates me. And I've talked about it so much. So if they weren't happy and they were trying to just be like, listen, we want to do something with these titles because nothing is being done with the titles. Cause you break up every woman's tag team when you get the chance. I'd be pissed too and be like, no, fuck this. We're done. And walk. I, yeah. Excellent. Uh, Tabo Myers, you hopped in the conversation a little late. How are you, sir? Hey, how you doing, yo? What's going on? Sorry I'm late. Sorry. No worries. We, uh, we're we dropping you in now. We got everything squared away. Um, wanted to cu uh, get you clued in a little bit on the conversation. Uh, one, quick uh, plug yourself real quick. Tell everybody hi and who you are. Hey, what's up, everybody? Um, I am Tavon, <laughs> obviously. Um, show is the TV. I am a wrestling content creator. I do live streaming on Monday through Fridays of wrestling and gaming, but mostly wrestling. And um, that's me. Thank you for inviting me. Excellent. Well, uh, I appreciate you hopping on. So just to kind of uh, clue you into the conversation real quick as to where we're at, uh, we were starting with Katie. We were discussing what has us pissed off for greatness in wrestling, and we were discussing the, the Sasha and Naomi uh, situation from last uh, night. Um, so do you want to hop in real quick and throw uh, your two cents in on Sasha and Naomi? You know, it's it's a tricky situation. Like I was talking about that earlier on stream, actually. Um like, I don't know what to make of it, because I, I, I got, like, a bunch of different thoughts about it. Like, like first and foremost, like, I, what Sasha Banks did, like, as far as, like, leaving like that, and Naomi was unprofessional, I understand that. But at the same time, I kind of commend them, because, like, in a way, they just try to, like, let their voices be heard by, like, saying, like, the way the company is right now and like creatively wise like it's really bad so i understand they're trying to send a message so i understand on that part but at the same time it's like you know especially sasha like you know people use sasha doing like this type of thing because it's like, the first time that she done something so recklessly like this and you know i hate that it had to come down for her doing so but you know i'm glad it's Finally, somebody like this something, but at the same time, it's like you know, it just had to be Sasha the one that doing. That's my issue, though. You know, like if it was anybody else, like I think people would probably make a big deal about it. But the fact that it's Sasha the bank, that's why it's kind of like I'm out of proportion and like people making like a big big deal. You know, so that's my stance on it right now. Uh, as far as the situation with Naomi and Sasha Bank goes. Uh, Kitty, what are your opinions on what Bobby said about Bailey being over Sasha as far as then the four horsewomen? Uh, where do you rank Sasha and those four ladies? Um, so I'm not the biggest fan of Charlotte or Sasha. 
in ring work, they're incredible. No, no doubt about it. They are both very fucking talented. I just don't, something about them, I don't know. I'm not, it doesn't click with me. Um, but Bailey, I think, is incredible, hands down, always has been. She's probably my top. Um, and then after that, I don't know, it becomes a shit show. So I have Bailey as like my top of the four horsewomen. And then just the, everyone else kind of just floats in and out of those three spots. Okay. I also have Bailey as number one on my four horsewomen. Um, I think Charlotte is the best in ring worker of all of them, but I think Bailey is the best talker. But her, you think she's the you're gonna call it sorry sports, enter, sports entertainer. Do you think that do you think that's what makes Bailey better than Charlotte Flair though, Bobby? Is the fact that she's a sports entertainer more so than a professional wrestler? Yeah, that'd be my opinion. Like Charlotte is a pro wrestler um, with lots of good sports entertainer styles, but Bailey I think is the most all around sports entertainer. I, that's why I would put her above Charlotte as far as total overall work would solely be based on the fact that I think she can out talk any of the other three women without question. I think she's not, I think that Charlotte outworks her in a ring ability wise. Um, but I think that Bailey is absolutely the best uh, talker. Um, as, as far as the Sasha and Naomi thing, I think we need to wait and hear their side of this story because I think once they finally speak to somebody and kind of give their side of it as to what's going on, we'll also see it. There's also the possibility that it's a complete work. Uh, do any of mm -hmm. you think that that's uh, the outcome? Is that it's all for show, it's a work, they're just going to use it to, uh, to get some cheap pop and then roll in in a week or two and come back like it never happened? I, I was actually thinking that, like... They, like the way the company is right now and like how they're just trying to generate some type of buzz like get people talking about it like i was kind of thinking like that was like it could be like a work you know and it still could be but like as you mentioned i think like right now i think like we gotta just calm down chill out just take a few steps back and wait for them to chime in and, and give the information on the situation I think so as well. I don't think it's a work. I think there's enough signs that point to us that they're just frustrated. Uh, there's enough arguing going on right now as far as the women's division go and the tag team division as a whole that there's not a, lo a lot of utilization. Um, Allison, the, the boss bitch at Boss Botch and Chair Shot, she, she preaches regularly about the, the misuse of the women on the roster at WWE as far as the amount of time they're given and how they're thrown into stories and then two weeks later we're expected to, to remember that these timelines and these tag teams and these stories never took place and now they're going to force feed a whole nother story to us. And uh, I think the women's division in WWE is not getting the proper handling it needs. And I'm not necessarily going to say that I think AEW's women division is doing it the correct way at all. But I think that in the, the big three, if you look at it as Impact, AEW, WWE, I think WWE has the weakest women's division of the big three right now. Well, I think the tag team belts for the women's division was a mistake. Um, I know Sasha and Bailey pushed for them, but as soon as they got them, they lost to the Iconics, which no matter you know where the Iconics have gone and all that kind of stuff, the Iconics at that point in time were not as good of a tag team as what Bailey and Sasha was. And that's where Sasha's first temper tantrum happened and she left. Um, and since then, really, the women's tag team division and those championships have just been kind of thrown around. And to me, Naomi and Sasha are one of those makeshift tag teams. Like it's, I, I know they had a little bit of a history like way back in the day and but I really don't even remember that trio that happened. Um, Once I think again, I one. reiterate the fact that you stopped yeah, watching bad. Ring in 1995, yeah, Bobby. Bad. Like, What's that? I said, that I reiterate the fact that you stopped watch, stopped watching wrestling in 1995, Bobby. Um, I think that if you look at the women's division as a whole, I feel like next to maybe the Kabuki Warriors, uh, Bailey and Sasha, like they were one of the better tag teams in the women's division at that point. They were a powerhouse. They definitely pushed for it. I think they held the championship two times total. Am I wrong in that? Did they end up getting a third reign or was it only the two? I think it was I, only the two. I thought it was only one. Yeah, no, I thought were, it was 
Two. Two. I know this for is sure. Sasha's third reign. It's two for Sasha and Bailey. Okay, that's what I yeah. wasn't sure. I couldn't remember if Sasha and Bailey had the third one or not. Um, but the the point is, I feel like they were instrumental in building a division in the tag team women's division. But WWE doing WWE things has allowed this whole division to kind of flounder week to week. And having a women's tag team title on the main roster and a women's tag team title in NXT, when if you look at the total TV time for both products, there's not enough time to really build and establish these huge stories for both these belts. I think they should unify those belts in the women's division and let the champion go between all three shows. Well, it's like I said before, like women's soccer, like the women's soccer players, like want to like demand the money of the men's soccer players, but they don't bring in the audience. So if there's not a high for women tag team wrestling, then they're not going to get as much screen time. Uh, Allison says, here's something to think about. We know Bailey has been cleared, but still isn't back. Do we think she is just trying to write out her contract to go somewhere else? No. No? No, I don't, I don't think so either. I think um, they just... Uh, Trying to figure out what to do with Bailey at the moment, uh, at at this moment in time. Which honestly, I have no clue where would you put Bailey right now, as far as how things are going on Raw and SmackDown right now. Honestly, you know. JJ ran in the chat speaking to doubled standards. It's a temper tra tantrum if it's the woman speaking up, but it's okay for the men to do it. Um, sure. I completely agree with that as well. I feel like. But once again, you go back to what happened. I used Tony Storm as the blanket and the control for this because it's the most recent one on my memory. But when she left WWE, everybody praised her for walking out. I remember all go girl, do your thing, all the, the empowering women type stuff. And I loved that. But you look at it from the reverse side of things and you see it now. And it's a lot of people really giving hate and heat for them walking out on their contract when they weren't happy with what was happening. They wanted out. They couldn't get the change. So they said, F you, here's our belts. We're going. I don't feel like if you're going to be a 1098 and you're an itemized contract for a company and you're a contracted worker, then in my industry, if I walked into a restaurant and I was a 1098 and I said, hey, I'm done, I can walk out. You know what I mean? That's the beauty in being a contracted worker. I can leave whenever I need to. I feel like, was it unprofessional? Maybe, but I don't feel like they did anything for with their careers in question. All they thought was, how can we better ourselves? And they didn't feel like WWE creative at the time was taking care of their careers. I am, I'm sorry. Okay. I was going to say, anyone who has walked out because they're not happy with creatives, specifically the women, when wwe and AEW can't get a good grip on their fucking women's division like impact has been doing great the knockouts division is the staple for women and it has been for years because that's a, that they built an entire they built a lot of their company on the knockouts they made the knockouts a focus for the longest time i mean everything they've done with diana mickey was in the women like the women's rumble like they care about the women and i'm a big per a big fan of like intergender stuff and they let them do that so i'm very happy but with tony leaving i was like you know what good for you 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 weren't doing anything you were getting a pie to the face on tv and it was doing nothing for your career uh, go off sasha and naomi were not happy they wanted to they again from things that I've been seeing. They just wanted to put a focus on the tag belts. But again, if you get rid of the entire tag division, how the fuck can they defend the belts? So they kind of got put, they got back in the corner and they said, no, we're done. Fuck it. And if they left, uh, I don't blame them. Chat says women outside the major companies are thriving. I completely agree with that. Um, the deeper I go into the independent scene, I said the other night, I tweeted something that said something along the lines of the best TV in the world right now isn't happening, or the best wrestling in the world right now isn't happening on your TV. Like, there's so many good guys on the indies right now, and I'm talking to indie wrestlers, you know, a couple times a week, few, almost every day now, and there's so many good guys and good women on the independent scene right now that are getting zero credit because everybody thinks the best wrestling is on AEW, WWE, Ring of Honor, Impact. They're not looking in their own backyards and realizing there are guys 
on the indies right now that could be world champion at any of the big companies. Bobby, I see your smirk. Yeah, those operative that operative word <laughs> in your backyard. Um, there's a that lot was, of these Indian guys. That uh, right there, sir, is what we call in journalism a bait and hook. Yeah, you you definitely hooked me there. Um, yeah, you know, indie wrestling again look at the stories and that's that's what i want to see is like the stories and i don't when i go to an indie show i hate when they open like monday night raw i hate when they open with that 15 20 minute interview to set up whatever they're going to set up like um you know they've got to develop these stories in the ring and a lot of these indie shows are spot shows and that drives me nuts like going around the circuit it just drives me nuts like you know a couple names you know you can still put like in Virginia and Tennessee, East Tennessee, sorry, um, and North Carolina. If you put Ricky Morton, Rock and Roll Express, Jimmy Valiant, you're guaranteed a house. And Jimmy Valiant, I have no idea how old he is, but I'm guessing at least in the 80s um, at this point in time in his life. Um, but you put those guys on the card, you're going to guarantee a house. And the rest of the card is all just spot, spot, spot. I will give them credit, though. Where indie wrestling is better than WWE, AEW, is variety. And that's something that Tracy Smothers always said was, you know what, you start with a you start with this kind of match, and then all of a sudden you've got this kind of match. And then all of a sudden you got this kind of match. And the show feels different as you go. Um, that's where indie wrestling, I think, really does thrive. And that's what I love about indie wrestling, is that fact that, you know, that locker room is small. And if, you know, just like the movie The Wrestler with uh, Nikki Rourke, if one guy's going to work the arm, another match is not going to work the arm. They're going to work the leg. They're going to work some other body part. And that's what I do like about indie wrestling. And I do like that storytelling. But when I go to some of these indie shows, that third match is just a spot fest. And the last match is a spot fest that does not tell a story. Chat says indie scene isn't for everybody, but always remember the big names came from somewhere. Um, all right, we're going to... That's true. That, that is true. Everybody has to come from somewhere. I feel like there's a lot of these performance center style places now, these workshops and these clinics that are putting people through these six and eight week classes, and then they're calling themselves professional wrestlers. When people... And uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite Bobby Mack, but I'm also not just... And you a, never will be. And I never want to be, but I'm also not just an AEW <laughs> fan either. I started wrestling or started watching wrestling in the early 90s. Um, so I appreciate the old days, but I also appreciate what's happening in the ring now. So I'm a good branch between the two. Um, I think right now, Bobby, when you look at the indies, you're looking them through rose colored glasses because you're used to the NWA. You're used to what the indies and what the territories used to be. You're not looking at what the territories have to be in 2022, post-COVID, post-everything that's happened. It's not the same business that it was 25 or 30 years ago. Um, Dude, I'm not that old. <laughs> I'm a teenager with these years. Like, when I worked the indies, it was literally six years ago, and it was five years before that when I started. So, yeah. I know. I'm I just have to give you a little bit of shit, man. Okay, uh, let's move around the circle a little, a little bit, uh, Mr. Myers. What has you pissed off for yes, greatness? Sir. What has you pissed off for greatness in professional wrestling? You know that would piss me off about wrestling right now. Yeah. Oh man, um, I was thinking about this earlier too. Like, it's mainly it's two things, but um, one of the things I hate is this war between WWE fans and. AEW fans like I just don't like it like I'm sorry like I, I don't see the point in it because like the way I see it like yeah you got big over here yeah, you got big over there but at the end of the day don't ain't, ain't we all want the same thing at the end of the day here like we all want a good wrestling show we all want to see stuff like stars get made we want to see good wrestling like we want to see good storylines in both companies like like don't we all want the same thing? So I see, like, I, so I look at it on social media, and I'm like, what's the point of the like the war here? Like, what war is this? Like, ain't we all fans at the end of the day? You know, like, I I just don't understand. Like, I never understand it then. I don't understand it now. Like, I hate it. I don't like it at all. K 
Katie, what are your opinions on, opinions on the toxicity of the IWC? Listen, IWC is toxic as fuck, and they have been for years. It's never going to stop. I brought it up earlier. It's never going to fucking stop. They're always going to be toxic about something. They're going to bitch and complain about something or the other. I personally just like to ignore all of the bullshit and focus on the small group that I have and interact with people I always do because I I appreciate other people and their opinions and I can I always respect other people's opinions because everyone's entitled to one. It, but sometimes people take it a twinge too far and I'm like if I respond, I'm going to say something out of pocket and it's not going to be good for any person involved. So I'm going to step back. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're always toxic. They're always going to be, and they're always going to bitch and complain because it's what they're there for. Bobby, you have no problems drawing heat. You have no filter <laughs> whatsoever in any part of your life, be it personal or professional podcasting, wrestling, or otherwise. What do you think about the IWC? Um, I totally agree with Katie. Um, everybody's got an opinion just like they do an asshole. And that's what a lot of people like perceive. And that's how they come off on the internet. Um, it's much different now versus the eighties because, you know, I'm so old. Um, <laughs> but, but the AWA, the AWA versus the NWA versus the WWF. Um, we didn't argue about oh, well, this person worked better and this person worked, you know, this match and this pro, you know, da, da, da. it was this superstars, or sorry, that's 90s. This wrestler is so much better than this wrestler. Like Nick Bonkwinkle can out-wrestle Hulk Hogan any day of the week. Anybody can out-wrestle Hulk Hogan any day of the week. Right. I said anybody could out-wrestle Hulk Hogan any day of the week. <sighs> oh, wait, I have a special sound for it. I did this, so every time you say Hulk Hogan. We've been hanging. You guys can't hear it, though. It's on the stream, though. It's there. It's a Hulk Hogan clip. I programmed like it, so every time you say his name, it'll play it for the guys in the chat. It's like that silent bar that just filled up the room. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but in the 90s, you know, it was WCW versus the WWE. We didn't argue that Kevin Nash was not as good of a worker as Shawn Michaels. We didn't argue any of that stuff. We argued that the NWO was more entertaining and more fun than what DX was. Like, that was our arguments. And then the 2000s rolled around. And now where we're at now with 20, the 2020s, like now the 2020s, this argument between AEW and the WWE, it's not fun. Like, it's not fun anymore. Like, it's not, like, it's personal. Like, you attack AEW fans because they don't like the WWE for whatever reason. It's not like we, we totally took the fun out of the prop, like the, the situation. Like I'm a Florida state fan. Will is a Tennessee fan. Will has no natural enemies because everybody beats Tennessee. Fuck Florida you, Bobby Mack. <laughs> <laughs> Florida state. We have a, you know, rivalry against university of Florida, but it's a fun rivalry and it's been fun for like 40 or 50 years. And we continue to have that fun rivalry where now what used to be with WCW and WWE, NWA, AWA, WWF, it's changed and it's not fun anymore because now it's just, Oh, you don't like MJF. Well, F you like Roman Reigns is the guy. And I think that's where, the IWC and professional wrestling has changed a lot. And I, I agree. Like it's this rivalry isn't fun and it used to be fun because you used to be able to pick player a versus player B. And now it's like, no, this company is where I'm going. And I hate this company. Why do you hate that company? Well, I don't know. Cause it's under the WWE banner and Vince McMahon sucks. And he's an old man. Like it's, it's changed. Like, there's no longer fun. Like there's no longer conversation. There's no longer debate. Like, and that's the problem with the IWC and the AEW versus WWE rivalry, in my opinion. Uh, the chat says, JJ says, IWC makes you want to not be a fan. Uh, Katie says a hundred percent. I completely agree with both of them. Um, sometimes I compare it when people are like, well, what do you do? And I say a lot of times I'll just blanket statement and say, I cover sports. 
Because to be completely honest, there's a lot of times saying that you're not only a professional wrestling fan, but somebody who tries to make a liver, living covering professional wrestling, it almost sounds like you have a really bad drug addiction that you're afraid to talk to people about. Because it's almost embarrassing because people are like, you know, it's fake, right? And you have to have that whole conversation every time you bring up the fact that you're a wrestling fan. People are like, it's yep. fake. It's like, fine, go jump mm -hmm. off a 20-foot ladder mm -hmm. through a table and tell me that it's fake. Dude, um, I went to theaters one time and watched a pay-per-view, and the girl behind the bar was like, oh, this is like a soap opera. And I said, well, when was the last time General Hospital drew your entire restaurant to be full and sit here for three hours cheering? Because Luke and Laura's wedding didn't mean that much. I mean, but it is a soap opera, though, if you think about it. It's 100%. a soap opera with hitting and weapons and bodily right. harm. And that's why people love it, is because it is a soap opera. That's why we get so invested in these characters and these storylines. And that's why we want to see things go this way or that. And when our faves, our favorite people, don't get the recognition we think they deserve and whatever... That's why people get on the high horse and they're just like, listen here, this is what needs to happen with this person, X, Y, Z, and all of that. So I, that bartender wasn't necessarily wrong. It, that wrestling is just a big ass soap opera with kendo sticks and tables and a bunch of other shit that happens. Yeah, I've just never gone to a bar and watched a soap opera. That's because they're on in the morning. Nobody's going to the bar in the morning. If you are, we should talk. Like you got, you might want to go see somebody about that. Can we talk? And, and you know, and and I, I'm gonna bring this up too late. Like and then, like to continue with that uh, soap opera. Like that's exactly what we all want. Just a good soap opera on TV, just with wrestling. Like that's the main goal that we want. Not just in WWE, but in all wrestling promotions. You know, just in entertainment, fun. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants a good story. It doesn't matter what you're watching on TV. If you don't have a good story and it doesn't keep you invested in it, it doesn't keep you drawing in week over week over week with a good series, then that's not getting the point across. We like stories that involve people beating the shit out of each other and throwing each other through tables and being involved in these big elaborate cage matches. Like, there's no difference between our stories and what we choose to spend our time watching versus what everybody else does. But the difference is you don't see people sending out death threats because they like ER over Grey's Anatomy, which is, I feel like, what the IWC is doing when it comes to the WWE-AEW debate is it gets to the point where it's almost like they make you want to pick a side, even if you genuinely hate both companies anyways. Yeah, both companies suck for different reasons, but we all still watch them. So just Facts. fucking accept it. Like, yeah. watch what you want to watch. Why the fuck does it matter? Chat says, if people can have viewing parties for The Bachelor, then why can we not do the same for wrestling? 100% yes. agree. I miss right. old school WrestleMania viewing parties where you would get together at your boy's house, order pizzas, hang out for three or four hours and watch wrestling. Like, I, re I miss the spectacles of what it was like to watch a pay-per-view and the the premium live events can go suck it like fuck that mess like nobody likes that i'm still gonna call them pay-per-views because that's what it was and i remember setting back in the day saving up and buying the pay-per-views and then watching it and then staying up late before monday in school so you could watch the replay like i still remember those days and i still get nostalgic about that kind of wrestling because that's what I still think of when I think about being a wrestling fan is kind of that feeling of what it means to build up to the big shows and the matches and the stories involved in them. Uh, so to me, that's what I get into it. So I don't care if it's AEW, WWE, Impact, Ring of Honor, New Japan. Like my thing is if it's a good story, I'm going to want to watch the match. If it's a shitty match with a good story, I'm going to be still a little bit more inclined to watch it than I would be a really great match with a shitty story. I feel like you can have two workers that put a great match on, but if there's nothing behind it and they just get in the ring and beat the shit out of each other for no reason, then, like, why? Yeah, why I'll tell you what. That? Like, I was, I was a bartender in the 90s, late 90s, um, when the Monday Night War was happening. And it was at a restaurant. It was a bee and an apple. And on one side of the bar, we had WCW. On the other side of the bar, we had WWE Raw. In the middle of the bar is where we had Monday Night Football. And I guarantee you, 90% of the people there 
sat on either side for the wrestling of either WCW or WWE. And then they would watch Monday Night Football here and there, like pretend like they were Monday Night Football fans, but they were legit watching pro wrestling more than what they were Monday Night Football. And it was, it was fun. Like, it was like, you got to sit in the middle of this. And it was like those nitro parties that they used to like do at colleges. Like, you know, I know that was total work, but at the same time, like I was there and I actually experienced what it was like being in between the WCW fan and the WWE fan with Monday Night Football in the middle. Like the real sport was in the middle, but more people were entertained by what they were watching on those other two TVs. Completely agree. Mm -hmm. All right, Bobby, it's your turn. We've worked our way through the circle. My friend, what has you pissed off for greatness? Um, <clears throat> Ric Flair. Woo! Returning oh, to the thing at 70. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh no you know i'll tell you what i saw the nature boy back in 1985 i know 80 10 years before you were born um in norfolk scope in the hampton coliseum in the middle of the great american bash the height of the nwa wcw um and it was against Rock and Roll Express, Ricky Morton. And now here we are all these years later, 2022. I'm actually good friends with Ricky Morton at this point in my time in my life. And it's going to be the Rock and Roll Express and just announced today, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat teaming up in a six-man tag team match against FTR and Ric Flair. This could be a train wreck. But I will say this, if this is how Ric Flair wants to go out, if this is his true retirement match, it's not at a big show, it's not at WrestleMania, it's not Universe of Sean, you know, let it happen. Because you've got 68 or 69-year-old Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, um, the Rock and Roll Express are in their 60s, they have been nonstop for 30 plus years on the circuit. And they're in there with the Nature Boy, who obviously shouldn't be in there probably because of his health issues. But if he feels healthy enough, that the doctors are going to pass him because it's going to be in Tennessee. I believe it's going to be Nashville or Memphis, right, Will? You know? It's in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, it's going to be in Nashville. So FTR can drive this match. They can run this match. Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson – Ricky Dragon Steamboat, Ric Flair, all in the ring at the same time. I, at first when I heard this, was against it. Now that Ricky Steamboat has signed the dotted line, I'm for it. Like, this is the way that Ricky Steamboat and Ric Flair should go out. I know they've been wrestling each other since the 1970s. I think their first ever match was 1977 against each other. Um, I could be wrong very doubtful, but I could be wrong. Um, but Ricky Morton versus Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat versus Ric Flair, even Hoot, Robert Gibson versus Ric Flair has always been good. And I feel like those three veterans across the ring from Ric Flair, they are going to do their damnedest to make this match look good and make people go out and respect Ric Flair because I know all of, us, all of us that have seen him from our childhood or wherever you went into wrestling, we all have this perception of Ric Flair as the greatest ever versus, you know. But I'm hoping this match is legendary, and I hope this is the goodbye song that Ric Flair needs to sing. Because Luthez wrestled his last match at 74, and Luthez is probably known as the greatest professional wrestler ever when you really read the, you know, logs of wrestling, but uh, you mispronounce Bruno San Martino. Mm. No, Bruno San Martino does not. Bruno San Martino is not the greatest wrestler ever. He's he's a New York neither is Flair. But neither is Rick. Okay, Katie, let me ask you a question before uh, I let you go off on this tirade that I can see <laughs> building on your face as this happens. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you think? <laughs> get get loose i'm I'm give you some time to warm up here uh do you think there's anything that rick flair can do at this point in his career to make his image come back because everybody knows that he has i'm just 
do you think it's possible for Ric Flair to, to regain his glory? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree on that. once again that, totally is a, agree. that is a bait and catch <laughs> uh, what do you think about flair coming back katie just roll with it why the why the fuck is his old ass getting back in the ring why does he want to die in a ring because it's gonna fucking happen he wants to go on a blaze of fucking glory this is how it'll happen to you rick i swear to god People have you on their Deadpool this year. It might happen. I don't understand why, A, he thinks anyone should, like, it's a nostalgia act. We get it. And whatever, Rick did his thing back in the day before I was even a thought or born, whatever. That doesn't matter. The fact that this whole match, why? Why is it even happening? I don't understand. I get it, money, but you're risking the health. Uh, clearly, Ric Flair can barely walk, let alone uh, try and do a whole match. Are we kidding? I know the clip of him training has gone around, but it... Guys, guys, come on. No one... And if you do, uh, we might need to talk... Nobody wants to see Ric Flair wrestle a match. I, I'll respectfully disagree with that. Like, and same time, like I said earlier, Jimmy Boogie Woogie, Woogie Man Valiant is still selling tickets and wrestling matches. Jerry I Lawler. I don't even know who the fuck that is. <laughs> I'd say look him up. Um, he was a he's a WWE Hall of Famer, uh, tag team champion in the seventies. The Boogie Woogie Man was one of the biggest stars in the mid card in the 80s and 90s versus Paul Jones Army in WCW and NWA. Um, so, yeah, I definitely look him up for history wise. Um, Can I tell you a funny story real quick and just cut you off because it is my show? So, I'm going to, anyways. Um, I was at an indie show two weeks ago and he was at the indie show, Bobby. Did I not tell you that? No, you the didn't. whole ass came out there, 1980s gimmick, still with the long trench coat and the neon. Was it, was it, was it the blue and the, uh, the the blue and the black stripes? Yeah, like shaking his butt. Like he got the kids in the ring with him, and they were all doing the cheesy dance, like <laughs> it's 1984. Sweet. But like, it's really funny that you bring him up of all the old ass wrestlers from Tennessee you could bring up. But he just happened to be at an indie show with me like two weeks ago. Yeah, he. Wow. Uh, yeah. yeah, he he did a work kiss with me in the ring and like dropped me to my back. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's one of these old school wrestlers like he does that whole like old carny thing like when he wrestles he's like rah, 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 like that that's what he says but in between of him saying rah, 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 he throws out carny words and i'm like like i caught like i started picking up on it because i worked so many shows with him um but yeah like boogie woogie is like jerry lawler is 73 and jerry lawler still works a jerry lawler match when he's out there like and Jerry Lawler matches are not exciting, but because Jerry Lawler isn't good anymore, thank you. He also thank shouldn't you, be wrestling. This man had a fucking heart attack. Right on the side. <laughs> I have Monday Night Raw. Back in the ring. I'll tell you what: if Joe Montana wanted to throw on the, like pads and go out there and throw a ball, I'd pay to watch it. Like if um, Magic Johnson wanted to throw on his uniform and have one one-on-one -on -one with Larry Bird, I'd watch it. Um, so if Jordan wants to go out there against LeBron, I'd watch it. And this is, I think, more for the athlete. And if when you're an athlete, yeah, it's hard to give it up. Like, Will, I know you just, what, you just ran another, what, 5K? Yeah, I just, right there. Boom. Nice. I just finished my nice. first 5K post-cancer. Yeah, athletes want to give it up. And yeah, sometimes we should, but... If I can make five bucks and I can go in a ring and ring an ounce or if I can go to a uh, amateur wrestling and wrestle and make five bucks and I still get that thrill and I'm able to do it, then I'm going to do it. And Ric Flair at this point, yeah, TNA doesn't need to feature him. AEW doesn't need to feature him. WWE does not need to feature him. But he can go to StarCast with his son-in-law um, paying him probably $15,000 to go out there and work with one of the greatest tag teams ever, one of the greatest individual wrestler faces ever, and obviously one of the current 
best tag teams ever. Have fun, be safe, and I think that Ric Flair will get this match okay, and Ric Flair is going to sell a shit load of tickets because it's not only Ric Flair coming down to the ring one last time, it's Ric Flair sitting at that autograph table and signing autographs, probably $50 a like, autograph. All right, Tavon, let me ask you a question real quick. I'm sorry, Katie, I didn't even cut you off. Go ahead. No, 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 you're good. Uh, Tavon, do you think anybody should take the risk of having Flair wrestle again, both because of his health and his physical ability, but also because it's such a high-profile case to put him on a card and not even in a good way? Do you think it's worth the risk for a promoter to put Flair on a card right now? I don't think so. Um, you know, I, I feel so like me because of his age. And, and as far as I know, like, if I'm not mistaken, like, I think he also has heart problems as well, if I'm not mistaken. You correct me if I'm wrong on that. But um, I just feel like it's just going to be like a disaster. But at the same time, is they going to make a lot of money from this? The simple fact that it is Ric Flair, they know his age, they're going to watch. It, it's going to be more like they're watching to see if he crumbles, more so if they're watching to see him wrestle. They're going to be just waiting to see if he's just going to just drop in the ring, literally. That's why everybody's watching this. Yeah, it's like a car crash. You don't want a car crash right. in NASCAR, but when it happens, you watch it. Exactly. That's exactly what this is. There's a NASCAR waiting to happen. But at one point, does someone step in and be like, no, like you shouldn't do this? Yeah, I think this Vince McMahon has done that. Like, I think, and this, I think someone needs to now. Yeah, this like, isn't good for Rick. I mean, uh, listen, nobody wants to see someone die in a ring again. You would, you would but, think like, Charlotte would. Like, what, what does Charlotte feel about this? I've been wondering about that since it's been announced. I haven't heard yeah. Charlotte. Like, what does Charlotte think? Charlotte's just trying to go get ready for her wedding, and honestly, more yeah. power to her. Um, chats th chiming in. They're saying it's going to be a train wreck, but we're all going to watch anyways. Uh, Flair's going to need dialysis and a defibrillator on standby. Um, I'll say one thing about Flair, though. His entire career, his cardio has always been amazing. Like, no matter how much the guy drank and partied all night. Like they like every veteran talks about Ric Flair being in the gym that next day and his cardio never never faulted. Like Ric Flair again, I'm not, you know, this is a I don't want Ric Flair to like be the main event of WrestleMania or you know AEW or anything else. I just feel like knowing the indie circuit and knowing Ricky Morton as much as I do, I feel like this is going to be a 10, 15 minute match. Um, and it's going to be Ric Flair probably in the ring three or four minutes at the most. He'll hit a, he'll hit one or two spots, the upside down in the buckle. He's going to hit his spots and be out of the ring. He will either get the win or the pin. Um, and that's going to be the end of the match. Like it's the rock and roll express matches. They go six, seven minutes at the most at this point in their time. Um, Ricky Steamboat hasn't wrestled since, the WrestleMania match, uh, I think it was or a little bit after that, like 2000, what, 16, I believe it was, or 11. I have no idea when his last in-ring mm -hmm. match was. Yeah, with, with, with Chris Jericho. Um, yeah, it was Chris Jericho, Ricky, and a, a bunch of others, and Rick Flair is another yeah, one. Snuka, Flair, um, and then Mickey Rourke came out. Um, mm -hmm. He wrestled, I think he wrestled like two more weeks on TV, and then he was done. Um, this match, to me, it's it's going to be a show like this is going to be a complete show ftr is going to hide all three or all four of those veterans um inabilities to continue to work and they're going to take a pin by one of these veterans because they respect the business so much and um you know i i'm Again, I didn't want to see it. I don't want to see it. I'm sure I'm going to be disappointed. If I look at Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat, and the Rock and Roll Express from the 80s and 90s, this match is not going to be on the highlight reel. But I'm getting to see four of my favorite wrestlers ever go out there one more time, get the accolades from the fans, make some money, and... 
I'm going to be happy. It's like that Babe Ruth speech. If you watch that 1920, what is it, 1926? Or I think Babe Ruth came out when he had throat cancer. Yeah, it's, it's bad. Like, Babe looks bad. But that was Babe Ruth. And he walked out there to get one more accolade, one more fan, like, just exception. And this is what Flair's doing. And hopefully this puts a tie on Ric Flair's career. Like, Ric Flair... You're the greatest. Sorry, Katie. Ric Flair, you're the greatest, but your time's over. Hulk Hogan, your time's over. Bret Hart, your time was way over. Nobody cares. We've been um, bad, 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 brother. That was for Will. Um, <laughs> but I, just, I remember to hit the button this time for you because you said his name again. Yeah. But, um, but at this point in time, yeah, it's, you know, say la vie. Like, this is supposed to be the Rock and Roll Express's last year of wrestling. If they end this with Ric Flair, and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, what better end of a career for these four veterans that gave us so much than this? Uh, Katie, the chat says, how is Rick being in the ring different from Vince having a match at Mania? Everyone popped for Vince, and he's in worse health than Rick. Uh, what do you think about that? I, like, I think that Rick and Vince are equals as far as health and age and ability go. What do you think about it? the the Vince versus Rick in a, a ring thing. I didn't want Vince in a ring either. Why? Like, I get it. You're the, the man of the company, but you didn't have to. You saw how he took that stunner. Vince has been taking a stunner from Funko <laughs> for like 20 fucking years, and you folded like a piece of paper on the kick, Vince. On the kick! He, sh he There was no reason for Vince to be in that ring. I didn't want Vince in that ring. I was one of the only people who was just like, why the fuck is this happening? Why? So Katie I get it. I get it. Money, uh, whatever name. I get it. I get all of that. But again, there's got to be a time when people just got to be like, nah. Katie, if, you just... had, if, if you had five bucks, would you pay to see... Stone Cold Steve Austin walk into a ring, or would you pay that five bucks to watch? Um, what are those two guys with the kiss cam? Los Lothar. Oh, Rio and yeah, Gaza. Or, yeah, or would you watch those two guys come in the ring? Which one? Which one would you want to see for five bucks? Like, if that was your last five bucks, Stone Cold or those guys? Is are they walking to the ring? Or are they having a match? have a match promo whatever stone cold because he can still do a promo if it's ring no i don't want if if what steve did at mania was perfect he did what he had to do there wasn't a whole it wasn't a whole lot of like wrestling wrestling it was a lot of just spots which with steve and his bad knees and his terrible neck he knew what he was doing and he's had the ring and he's been training and whatever. I, I just don't understand anymore. I think it's come to a point where the nostalgia act has to stop at some point. Like oh, I, for the, for the health of the people alone at this point, I don't care. I agree with that. I actually no, agree I, with I, that. hundred percent agree. Like I think the issue is WWE and AEW are not developing new stars. Like AEW, like for instance, you know, they've, they've got Marco Stunt, or they did have Marco Stunt. They didn't develop him. You know what made AEW big? CM Punk, Daniel Bryanson, John Moxley, all these guys that are already established. They're, to me, already a nostalgia act because they're 10 plus years in the business. Like, where and when is AEW, WWE, Impact going to develop our next stars? And it's sad now because we're looking at rick flair and the rock and roll and all them these are 80 stars that we're still mm -hmm. we'd rather pay for them than the current guys like theory like then wrestlemania is headlined by 90 stars steve austin um you know years before that the rock and everything else we're paying for them instead of the current quote-unquote stars so other than mjf where has the development go like what happens in 10 years who are we going to go to in 10 years when the 80s guys can't do it anymore 
The 90 guys can barely do it now. Um, John Cena is not going to be making a bunch of comeback tours. In 10 years as long from as now. He makes one more, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, 20, <laughs> in 2032, what nostalgia acts do we have? Because there's no stars now to be nostalgia. Like our leader on Raw or is it Raw or SmackDown? Edge is already WWE Hall of Famer from the mm-hmm. 90s and early like 2000s. Like, where is it? Is it like Rhea Ripley? Like, is she going to be the guy that, or sorry, lady that you want to buy a ticket for? Or, you know, um, yes. Have you seen Rhea Ripley, Daryl? I'm just saying, in, <laughs> no, I'm saying in 10 years from now, is Liv Morgan going to be the one that's going to sell out a show? Maybe. So, we don't know what will happen in 10 years. Look at NXT. Yeah, NXT is another thing. Like, I remember there's some good, talented male and females down there that could possibly take the reins. Ron Breaker. Solo Sokoa. Carmelo Hayes. Yeah, that's Solo three Sokoa. right there. Yeah. I think Carmelo Hayes, I saw somebody earlier compare him. They compared him to John Cena in the sense that he's young and hungry, I think. But I hope that if Carmelo continues to, to, to adapt to the business and – educate himself and continue to grow as a worker in ring. I think he has 100% star potential. I said the same thing about uh, Isaiah Swerve Scott, uh, Swerve Strickland. Mm -hmm. I said that when he was in NXT, he was 100% wrapped in gold. There was no reason for him not to be a champion. I said he would eventually become the NXT champion and they moved hit row to SmackDown, then released them all. Um, I still said that was a mistake because he's gone to AEW and even on an oversaturated roster, he's still shown like every time he's been on the screen that he's premier talent every time he works. Mm-hmm. Yep. Bobby, anything to throw in? Oh, I thought you were the host of the show. I am. I'm just, I, I'm very polite. <laughs> I like to ask everybody else before I start rolling. Uh, you guys no, have all. No, th- the Rick Blair part, so I'm good. Okay. You guys have all three had a turn. So now it's my turn. Tonight, the one thing I'm going to throw a dart at the board and choose that has me pissed off for greatness the most in professional wrestling is the WWE Identity Crisis. And I've written about this, and I've spent a lot of time talking about it. Uh, But we recently have gone through another name with Kylie Ray becoming Alba Fire. We've seen Pete Dunne become Butch. We've seen Piper Niven become Dewdrop. We've seen Walter become Gunther. We see all of these established stars come from other brands inside the WWE, and when they move them to the main roster, instead of just letting those stars transition to the main roster, they want to rebrand them and almost start building them from scratch. I don't see any point in why Walter can't go to the main roster and be Walter. Why is he going to get over more as Gunther? Why is Butch easier to get over than Pete Dunn. I don't think you should take the time to build and establish these stars and other brands just to move them to the main roster and make them start over. I hate it. It drives me crazy. And it seems like they're doing it more now than they ever have in the past. Did I leave you guys speechless? Well, I was going to see Daniels wanted to talk. Oh, <laughs> you, 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 you can go, Katie. You can go, Katie. Watch, watch, I'm in on it. Um, so something I've noticed is a lot of these talents who do get called up or whatever. Um, a lot of them keep their name. Like, so, um, like Casey Gonzaro's name got changed to Katana Chance because Casey Gonzaro was an established name before she even came to NXT. So I think a lot of it is these wrestlers talent whatever you want to call them um trying to keep their name that they've made like pete dunn walter etc trying to keep that to the chest and take it with them if they choose to leave wwe because then they have the opportunity to still be this name this person this identity they have created so that's that's my take on it like some of the names are a little goofy but i've kind of just Learn to roll with the punches at this point. Yeah, like Butch. <laughs> yeah, Butch like, I, well, pissed me <laughs> off at first, but now I like I I still call him Pete Dunn because it's just habit. So yeah, it's like a habit. Like what? Like what? Why? Like it's like we're used to 
seen like hearing these names and then they change these names and I'm sitting there like what the fuck? and I'm like like for one thing like I feel like some of these names like we're gonna get used to like after a while but it's just some like Gunter you know what I'm saying Crowd still chants Walter Walter like I like I hear that and I'm thinking to myself like is WWE listening to this like are they hearing this right now? Like, they still chant Walter to this very day since they changed his name. And I'm wondering if they, well, I don't, I don't think they will, but I, I'm wondering now, are they ever going to consider changing back to their original names, you know, at this point in time? But that that's my take on it. I just feel like, like some of the names I feel like we can get used to down the line, and some of them I feel like we're just never going to get used to down the line. Bobby, um, Tito Santana, tag team champion and intercontinental champion, El Manador, um, Jacques Rougeau, tag team, uh, no, not a tag team champion, long time tenured WWF wrestler, um, became the Mountie, Steve Lombardi, Brooklyn Brawler, uh, Terry Taylor, Red Rooster, uh, Rick Martel, the model, um, Kerry Von Erich uh, became Texas Tornado. WWE has a long history of this. They delete people. The difference now is they're deleting people's history from where they were in territories or other federations to where they are coming into WWE. Um, so this is not new. Just like pumped in crowd noise is not new. This is WWE from day one since Vince McMahon, WWF, took over in 83. So the difference is, is that he owns NXT. We're developing NXT. It's a developmental territory. Um, so that's the biggest difference is that he owns the people that he's changing. You know, Dusty Rhodes, the American dream was no more. It was the guy in the polka dots. Um Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson weren't horsemen. They were brain busters. Um, so to me, this isn't new. This is just historically what WWF, WWE does. Um, do I agree with it? No. Like Walter, Butch, um, these guys that are changing their names uh, from Austin Theory to Theory, it's stupid. Like it doesn't make sense. But Again, this isn't new for WWE. This is not their, this is their regular thing. And just like when people say, you know, all oh, the, the crowd noise is pumped in, you notice it now because COVID happened and we noticed it during that COVID era. But that crowd noise has been happening forever. I remember back in the 80s, 90s, when I went to a live taping, they told us before the event started, cheer for like two minutes. And then boo for two minutes. And when I watched that uh, WWF Superstars episode, I was like, oh, that's our noise. Like that's, you know, I noticed it then. Um, but yeah, it's, this is, this is what WWF does. This is what WWE does. This is probably what AEW will do eventually. Um, you got to own those rights to those names. And, uh, you know, I'd rather own the name to Mr. Perfect than I would to Kurt Henning. And I think that's really like where, like, that's the bottom line of it. So Stone Cold said so. Um, God, but that's really. So much. <laughs> 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 but, but again, like, this is this is stuff that it, it's always happened. But now, because of the internet and because we're now more informed, we're getting behind, you know, we're, we're behind the curtain more than more than ever. And, you know, this this stuff does need to happen because WWE, WWF, whatever, needs to own these rights and make the money from these rights and from these names. But do I agree with it? No. Dusty should have never worn polka dots. Uh, Tito Santana never should have walked out there like a bullfighter. Um, Rick Martel was not a model. Uh, but I will call them all those names because WWE programming to do that. Uh, Katie, I agree. I, I listening to what your argument was about them wanting to keep themselves. 
I can agree to that. That does make sense. Like the idea that they want to hold on to their identity. If it was their decision to be like, uh, cause if you look at somebody like stone cold, Steve Austin, for instance, since Bobby just put him on my brain, uh, before WWE, when he was in, uh, WCW, ECW, some of those other places, he was still stunning Steve Austin and some of the other variations of who he was. Stone Cold Steve Austin as a whole was a very much WWF thing. So they own his entire catalog, all because his the, the majority of his career when he was at his peak was as Stone Cold Steve Austin. So somebody who has an established career on the indies or somewhere else coming into WWE, I could appreciate why they would want to change their name so that way WWE didn't take the rights to it. Uh, like somebody like AJ Styles is a hard example to say because he wasn't a WWE branded guy, but he came in and kept his name because there was nothing WWE could do about it. You know what I mean? Cause he was AJ Styles before he's AJ Styles. Now that's who he is. And Samoa Joe, another example. Of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. guys that come in, that there's nothing WWE can do about it, but I feel like, uh, agreeing with you, Katie, that sometimes maybe they look at it like, uh, maybe this is the only way to keep their identity post WWE in the future, because you don't, everybody knows that WWE might be everybody's apex, but that's not necessarily the last job all of these guys have. So they've got to take care of themselves pre WWE and post WWE in most cases. Yeah. Like Barry Windham came in as the widow maker. Like he's fresh off the four horsemen. Tolly and Arn were there as you know, the brain busters. And he came in as the widow maker. Like it, he could have come in as Barry Windham and teamed him up with Tolly and Arn. And they could have been some variation of a horseman, which would have made a ton of money, but they didn't. You know, it's 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 weird how WWF, WWE, whatever, continued with that um, through the years. But yeah, it's a it's definitely an, like it's interesting if you definitely look into it and you see the guys that came in like in the '90s that were like established like main event guys from the NWA from WCW came to WWE, they didn't care where you came from. This is now, we know you can work in the ring. We know you can tell a story on the microphone, but now you're our character and you're what's going to represent us. Like honky tonk man's one of those guys too, as limited as he was when he came in, like they changed his name from Wayne Furness to honky tonk. And he adapted something and still was able to tell those stories in the ring and on the mic. Let me unmute my mic first. All right. I have two more things on my list. Uh, Let me get my life back in order. I have a really squeaky chair. So if I lay back and kick back and listen to Bobby rant, I'll uh, mute my mic. So that way y'all don't have to listen to my, my squeaky chair rock. But uh, then I forgot to unmute it because I'm unprofessional as fuck. Um, Oh, stop. So his contract is up in his contract is up in two more years. Why is everybody so hell bent on MJF leaving for WWE already? Like this is something that's been kind of irritating to me. He still has two full years left on his deal. Uh, Tavon, what do you think about MJF and why is there so much like conversation about a contract that can't be anything other than what it is for two more solid I feel like years. it's a it's, I feel like it's the trend right now you know when you see like wrestlers go from company to company right now and as soon as you see like they, they even get like a sniff that that contract about to be up like like they just automatically assume they're gonna go to the other brand like it's been that way since like we seen a lot of the WWE superstars go from WWE to AW I think that's why fans are keeping a close eye on this situation and that's my take on it but as far as njf goes i personally love him like i feel as though you know if he let's say if he does go not saying he will but let's say if he does go WWE, um i think he could be a success but not as successful as he is in aw because i feel like they're going to probably cut down tone down on some of his like promo work and uh you know um wrestling um matches as well so um but I, I, I've always been a fan of NJF, and um, personally, I would rather see him even AEW or somewhere else that's not WWE, in my opinion. But um, if I might take on JF and him going to uh, WWE, um, you know, I, that's how I feel, but I just feel like he's not going, in my opinion. I don't think he's going at all. I think people are reacting. 
Katie, what do you think about MJF's contract situation? Um, so something I've always said about like when contracts and shit come up, like with Adam Cole, Johnny Gargano, uh, Brian Danielson, a bunch of other people that I could name. Um, I always have been saying, if they want to leave, let them leave and go be happy. Like, because that's all she really should really matter is how the person is. Like, if you're not happy in one company and you get the opportunity to leave and go explore something else, go explore something else if you want to. Adam Cole left NXT where he was a golden goose for three to four years. And now he gets to be with his girlfriend and his best friends and have fun. And he still and he still enjoys it. So if Max isn't happy in AW, maybe they can figure something out in two years. If not, let him go wherever he wants to go. Not necessarily WWE. Let him go to like NWA or some shit. Because I think as much as I... I, like, I have, like, a love-hate relationship with MJF. Like, he's kind of an asshole, but, like, it works because he is a good heel. Um, I think if he ends up leaving AEW, it's going to kind of be beneficial because then it can kind of rein in his promos because he can get a little too much sometimes, you know, with everything that would happen with, like, Brian Pillman Jr. and all of that. Uh, so he can be a little too much sometimes. So he like, if he ends up leaving, that would give him the opportunity to like tweak it, tone it down be like, so here's the bubble. I can't pass the bubble kind of thing. But if he stays in AW, then he can go and be a champion and be a pain in the ass and still swear at everyone and do whatever he wants to do. So I just, again, it's like contracts are a big topic recently. So I think that's why people are talking about it now. And because MJF has like kind of talked about it on screen. So then people are like, there's our opportunity. Let's talk about it. Bobby, you got two cents? Yeah, MJF is the best professional wrestler on the planet today. You're so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I honestly agree. Like, I think that MJF is the best pro wrestler today. Like, whether he can work a five-minute match or ten-minute match in the ring doesn't matter. His promos are amazing. His stories are amazing. He was signed to AEW as an indie darling, less than the Bucks, less than Omega, less than page and now he is in every main event cm punk daniel bryanson he is the guy like <laughs> he is leading he is leading aw like he is the guy no matter if you sign these guys you never saw like he is warrior to get ready get ready will you ready I'm already got my pen out, so I can write down whatever you're about to say. He is warrior to Hogan. He is Michaels to um, Hart. MJF is that second fiddle, the Jake the Snake Roberts, the guys that are ready to overcome the main event. And when AEW finally pulls the trigger and puts him as the world champion, because he's not going to be Kurt Henning. He's not going to be Jake. He's not going to be uh, these guys that didn't get that belt. He's going to get the belt. MJF deserves all the money in the world because he is the reason why you watch AEW. To me. Because he's the most interesting character, actor, wrestler, everything. He's the sports entertainer that I tune in for because I want to see what he's going to say next. When he goes to WWE, they're going to educate him on how to be a national star versus the regional star that he is now. Because they're going to put those they're going to put those restrictions on him and he might fight a little bit, but he's also smart enough to understand and know that if he wants to be the Rock, Hogan, Austin, he's going to have to play ball. And I think MJF is one of those rare characters, one of those rare people 
that understand there's more to professional wrestling than work rate in the ring. Uh, chiming in on my own thoughts, I think that MGF, MJF is one of the best heels on the planet right now in the, in the business. I would say top two, top three heels in the business. I would put him... Who's above him? Heel-wise work right now. I would probably say not necessarily above him, but on any given day, I would say Roman is up there. Uh, he's been a solid. He's got that that baby face heel though. People hate that mm -hmm. they want to cheer for him and they hate his guts, but he still gets big pops everywhere he goes. Like he's he's a bad example of it, but he's a heel character that's still over as fuck. I would say Roman is a talker. He's a, he's definitely a better worker in ring than MJF is. Um, so I would say that that would be one thing that I would say above him. Another person that I feel like is a better heel than MJF is, uh, and honestly, I might catch some heat for this, but I think Matt Cardona right now is doing hella good with the way he's talking on the mic and the way he's working in a ring. And I know you don't like him, Matt, or my, uh, Bobby. You don't like Matt, Mike, or Bobby. But I know you don't like him very much, but I think Cardona is doing a lot of the same stuff. Seth Rollins, Allison's chiming in. She just said it. Seth Rollins is a better talker than MJF. He's a better worker than MJF. So, I mean, My that's another Matt hill that I would put above him. Matt's cheap. Matt's cheap heat. Like, he, he wants it, like, he curses. Like, oh, fuck this. Fuck you guys. Fuck your city. Like, that's what Matt Cardona is doing. Like, he's that's not That's basically what MJF does, except without the Fs. Yeah, exactly. that's right. Right. thank you, Katie. That's my point. Like he's doing the exact same stuff MJF does without the filter of what she was saying about WWE putting Max in a bubble and then AEW removing the bubble a little bit further. What Matt Cardona has right now is the fact that indie promotions are just throwing dollars at him to come into their ring, help put over their local stars, and to say whatever the fuck he wants to on a mic. And that's the problem. Like it's. It's never going to make him any more money. It's never going to develop him, I think, as a wrestler or a character. Like, WWE is going to look at that and go, no, forget that. Like, where Cody went in, and I'm not a Cody fan, but what Cody did, Cody played the game, and he played professional wrestling. Cardona's going in, and he's cursing and all this other kind of stuff, like, to these bottom feeders, and that's where he's getting over. That's where he's getting cheered. Because when Howard Stern went to, like, went from radio to um, the closed circuit, whatever he does now, like, when you can say fuck, it's like, oh, my God, I can cheer. Yeah, you say fuck. Like, and I agree when me and Matt, or uh, when me and Will first started, I was like, I can curse. Okay, cool. Like, <laughs> that's cheap. Like, that's a cheap, that's a cheap, like, you know, excitement level. Like, if you can go out there and tell the story and keep it PG, PG-13, and produce to an audience, then that develops the audience. Like if, um, I don't know, like uh, what's David Hasselhoff, if he went out there and just said, hey, fuck you, Kit, we'd all cheer. Like, oh, he's cursing out the car. Knight Rider reference, Katie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if he goes out there and he talks to Kit and tells Kit, why he's doing what he's doing then it's a different kind of like story like i'm now developed more into the night rider versus him just saying you know go fuck yourself like it again i can curse all day long and get all the like people like cheering because it's like oh he's cursing he's fun like that da, da, da. but at the end of the day develop your character and cardona is not developing character he's falling into that indie guy that robbed the banks and did all that other shit um and then went to AEW for one match and now he's back on the indie circuit um doing you know making five hundred dollars a night or a thousand dollars a night like it's you've got to develop more and cody took advantage on the indie circuit by developing more and there's a lot of the guys out there that developed more because they understood there's a professional level to professional wrestling and cursing is not going to do it. And that's where I think Cardona's downfall is going to be. Katie, Tavon, you guys got anything to, to close out on MJF? 
Um, one thing I will say about MJF, though, like, I definitely agree when it comes to if he goes to WWE, he would definitely um, adapt. And, of course, he'd be great there, you know, especially, you know, considering, like, the circumstances of, um, like, WWE and and the AEW and all that stance. Like, you see what Cody's doing right now. Like, they've been, like, he's been there for, what, like, like two minutes? And they already, like, shoving him down our throats, <laughs> you know? So I feel like it's going to be that same type of way with MJF. Um, that could be a good or a bad thing, you know, depending on how they book him. And um, if he does go to WWE, like, again, like, um, I'm, I'm cool with that. I'm fine with it. But I just don't think he's going personally. But if he does, I'm ready to see what happens, you know? Like, go for it if that's the case like whatever you want to do like and i'd be with k too when it comes to make them happy like whatever makes them happy you know what i'm saying i said the same about brian because a lot of people in my chat were like you know i, I don't want to see brian go to AEW. i don't want to see brian go to AEW. and i'm like i'm sitting there telling him like let him do what he wants like if this will make some happy just want to do go for it you know and i was happy like personally i would love to see brian still in WWE, but if if he's happy where he is fine you know go for it i'm happy for him either way yeah. Well, look, this is the way I'm going to start closing all of my episodes. Uh, I do when I close out an interview segment, I always end every interview with five rapid fire questions. I'm not going to ask 15 questions because there's three of you. That's going to be ridiculous. So I'm going to ask each one of you one random question from my list and you have to answer me truthfully. OK. You ready? Okay. Got you. Tavon, what's your favorite sport that isn't professional wrestling? Football. What's your favorite team? Panthers. The Panthers? Yep. Are you a Cam Newton guy? I am. I am. I, I was. <laughs> we was there. But yeah, I am. I was. Bobby, what's your favorite food? Sushi. What kind of sushi? Raw. Thank you, smart ass. What kind of fish? <laughs> <laughs> what? Octopus with wasabi. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Katie, who is your favorite musical artist or performing group? Oh, God. No, that's not fair. I got to oh, hold on. I have too many in my brain. Uh, fuck. Ha, I put um, you on the spot. Yeah, you really did. Uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> um. Any answer than the, other than the Beastie Boys is wrong. Bobby, mind well, your business. Let the lady answer. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Um, oh, fuck. See, that is really hard. I'll go with the band I've seen the most, which is like eight or nine times. I don't even think any of you will know who this is. Uh, it's a band called Mayday Parade. They're like a pop punk-ish emo type band. That's my type of music. Um, I've met the lead singer and the guitarist. I've seen them, like I said, I've seen them eight times. I just saw them. It was my first concert in like a year. I saw them a few months ago. One of my favorite bands, I have their autograph. They're just, their music can make you excited and then make you depressed all, all in the same album and that's my type of music so nice okay uh my answers real quick my favorite sport not wrestling is 100 percent football i'm a tennessee titans fan uh my favorite food is pepperoni pizza so much so that i have a piece of pepperoni pizza on the back of my wrist uh, nice my favorite musical artist or performing group is a toss-up between three and it is forever changing it is a toss-up between the wu-tang clan pink floyd and the grateful dead um, a very eclectic taste in music uh also kind of an old jam band like deadhead so uh i've seen fish like 25 times which is completely useless i went through this whole music festival scene in the early 2000s bonnaroo was in my backyard so why not um, okay, this is my favorite part of the episode because it's my easiest part. I'm going to ask you guys to plug your stuff. Katie, ladies first. All right, well, uh, like Will said in the beginning, I'm the host uh, of the She Leech Showcase. 
Uh, if you want to see everything she did showcase, you can go to my Twitter at Katie Raslin 13. There's a link to in my bio to thank you to all things she lead. Uh, we have a Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash she lead showcase. Uh, we're moving our time frame up. So instead of Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern, it's now going to be Thursdays around 6 p.m. Eastern, which makes my life a whole hell of a lot easier. Uh, we have a YouTube channel if you'd like to go check out the videos of everything we do. Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, if you'd like to listen. Uh, she Lead Showcase is kind of like the weekly recap My ho- uh, me and my co-host Savannah do. I have an interview series called Inside the Mind of, where I interview people in the wrestling community and kind of just get to know them besides like the podcasting they do. Um, so those are all up on the channel. And then there's a collab show called In the Crowd. I basically turned it into a game show of like, know your co-host. Uh, thank you to my friend Matt Ritter for telling me the idea and I kind of just took the ball and ran. Those are up on the channel. And then my co-host Savannah has a show entirely to New Japan for Wrestling because that's not my thing. That's her thing. I gave her her whole show. Uh, it's called the New Japan Takeover. And if you'd like to see that up on the channel as well. We also have merch. I don't really care if you go by like the logo t or anything there is something you should buy i have it with me it is a pro wrestling pro choice t-shirt uh the design was created by jizzy doodles uh formerly known as uh dead ass girls love her to pieces she created the design i'm collaborating with mr matt ritter again if you buy a shirt or anything from my store all the proceeds are going to Planned Parenthood because women should have a choice on what the fuck they do with their bodies and we're really sick and tired of old white men trying to tell us what the fuck to do with it. Well said. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Tavon Myers, plug your stuff. Tell everybody where to find you, brother. All right. Well, um, you guys could definitely uh, find me pretty much anywhere like tiktok uh instagram twitter youtube twitch etc all at showstopper tv or lowercase on the youtube channel we have a fun little series in universe mode in which we allow you guys if you've got a character in the community creations you can definitely join in and watch your character have fun with it and engage with others in the chat with their characters as well and see if you're lucky enough to be a champion and thrive on our universe mode you know it's a lot of fun a lot of people love it um we got a new video coming uh SummerSlam big show we got uh two surprise key matchups in store for uh for you guys as well uh it's gonna be a lot of fun so definitely uh check it out and um if you're interested in joining you can just uh hit me up in on instagram or twitter if you're interested in joining or on youtube if you find me live or anywhere possible <laughs> um so you're still enjoying just let me know and um i'll see you there bobby mack your turn um yeah you can follow me home anytime you want from uh where i work at in dallas texas or if you want on the internet you can follow me at yellow shoe guy at twitch you can follow me yellow shoe guy at tiktok um and i guess what what else am i at I have no idea. But yeah, yellow shoe guy, yellow shoe guy, yellow shoe guy. Sometimes there's only one L in yellow, so it really throws you off. Um, but yeah, follow me all you want. Um, I love stalkers. Keep coming. Well, now it's my turn. So I'm going to say my spill about following the rewind. I always check out Kai and RN on the weekends when they do the rewind of the weekend wrestling as a whole. Uh, check out Kyle's show, Pop- uh, Unpopular Wrestling Opinions. It's always a hoot. He, uh, gets a panel together of wrestling content creators, podcasters, independent wrestlers. He gets everybody together and they read mean tweets and unpopular wrestling opinions and then pretty much just sit there and trashes them for an hour. It's a really good watch. It's a lot of fun. Uh, You should also follow Miss Allison Siegel. She's the boss bitch of Boss Botch and Share Shots at JustAGirl918 on Twitter. She is in charge of all things social media outside of the Twitter universe. Uh, She is all things important graphics, designs, business-related stuff. So uh, the brains of the operation where me and Bobby are just the brawn. Um, 
after that, oh, we do have a huge announcement announcing right now live on Twitch. Uh, Botch Bots and Chair Shots will be announced as the main event sponsor for the Shane Taylor Promotions versus Takeover event this coming Friday on IWTV. We will be the main event sponsor for that match, uh, helping support some of the athletes for that uh, event. So make sure to check that out on IWTV. So now as we close another episode of Botch Bots and Chair Shots, I want to take a minute and thank you for listening. Remember to like, subscribe, follow, unsubscribe, but then subscribe again. Leave a comment telling us how great we are, how terrible we sound. Either way, it helps the algorithm and helps us find new listeners. If you're feeling really generous and be one of those VIP people, head over to the Patreon and donate to the Smack Draw Podcast Network. You get some swag, we get some free guests. It's a win-win. As always, I'm your host, the chef. I fucked my own lineup. I am your host, a chef by trade and a mark by choice. I am the Will Gray. Thanks for stopping by and listening, my people.